so that the world could see the evidence of your resurrection. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is our help and salvation. Blessed is He who comes to heal and redeem. Hosanna, shout and oration. Praise to the Lord for the cross where He purchased my pardon. Praise to the Lamb who has shouldered the weight of my burden. Oh, praise His name, Christ who has borne all my shame. Sinners set free now before Him. Praise to the Lord that the people rejoice He is risen. to the word here this morning John chapter number 20 John chapter number 20 here today as we are going to look at I am not finished last week the title of our message was it is finished uh, what Jesus said on the cross it is finished and this morning we're going to talk about I am not finished now, that may sound like a contradiction but it is certainly not a contradiction. Now, in our church sign out here, we have uh, Easter at 10.30 a.m., the rest of the Christmas story. Uh, everybody's familiar with the Christmas story. Jesus left the glories of heaven and came to earth and was born as a baby in Bethlehem. And uh, he lived a sinless life, 33 and a half years. And then he died on a cross he was buried, and on the third day, what happened? He rose again, all right? He rose from the dead. And so that's what we're here celebrating this morning. Now, the resurrection, of course, is the foundation for other Bible doctrines. Before we read, let me just give you a few thoughts about that. You know, if, if Jesus did not rise from the dead then the Bible is not the inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God because the Bible says Jesus rose from the dead. So if He didn't rise from the dead, you know, the Bible's a pack of lies, right? Y'all don't believe that though, right? That it's a pack of lies. See, Jesus five times at least before He died predicted that He would die and that He would rise again. You remember He, early on in His ministry, He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rise it up. And that's exactly what He did. Now, if the resurrection is not true, the Bible is not the Word of God. But see, we know that it is the Word of God, and we know the resurrection is true. Now, if Jesus is still dead, we have no gospel to preach. You know what the gospel is, right? It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's, that's how it's described. It's the good news. And there is no good news this morning if Jesus is still dead. But He is alive. And you don't have a gospel uh, without a resurrection. I'll tell you this much. You cannot be saved if Jesus Christ is not uh, alive today. See, the Bible says He was raised for our justification. So there's no hope of being saved if Jesus is still dead today. But we know that He is alive. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 says that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So if Jesus is still dead, he's certainly not God. He's not deity. That's what the Bible teaches. 
All doctrines of the Bible. The Bible is a very hated book. We've talked about that. Uh, a couple of months ago or a few weeks ago, I preached on freedom of religion and talked about how people hate the Bible. Uh, if there are people in this world today that if they could, they would, they would take every Bible and they'd just burn them. And the only thing you'd have left is what's up here. But guess what? They're not getting that. They're not getting that. Now, uh, uh, the Bible uh, uh, and all doctrines, the Bible is hated. But I think this one more than any. See, before Jesus died, there was already a group of people running around saying there was no resurrection. They're called the Sadducees. Uh, you've heard of the Pharisees and you've heard of the Sadducees. Well, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection from the dead. Somebody said that's why they are sad, you see. We believe in a resurrection from the dead. That's why I'm not sad this morning. That's why I'm happy. That's why I'm excited uh, and, and very thrilled today. Paul, you know, uh, talking about the resurrection, Paul had to write a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians dealing with the resurrection. Chapter 15. The whole chapter deals with the resurrection and what's going to be happening in the resurrection of Christ. Uh, the, the church at Corinth was all messed up on that. And Paul wrote that whole long chapter, 58 verses, uh, to, to, to help them to understand the resurrection. And even in the book of 1 Thessalonians, he had to clear up some questions that they were having. Now, let's look at John chapter 20 and verse number 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away, taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they, both, they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Father, we ask today that you would again meet with us. We've already prayed that. It's already been prayed. And Lord, prayers have gone up all week for this service. And Lord, we're thankful for uh, each one that's out here today. And Lord, we're thankful for the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and what it means to us. It's not a sad day for us. This is a joyful day, a day of celebration, and we're grateful. If there's someone here today that does not know for sure about their eternal destiny, I pray they'll follow Jesus today. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, from our text, you notice that Jesus did not throw aside his grave clothes or the napkin that covered his face when he walked out of the tomb. He took very special care of those clothes that he had been wrapped in. Uh, they were neatly folded uh, and uh, left at the head of the stone coffin. Now, when somebody died in that day, and, you know, in some places you may still have uh, customs like this, and uh, somewhat in our time, but when someone died in that day, it became the duty of the son or a friend to close the eyes of the dead and then to kiss his cheeks or her cheeks. And when Jesus died, this became the duty of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, if you know the story. Uh, they had gone to Pilate. Uh, these two men, these two disciples, not, not actual of the twelve disciples, but they were followers of Christ, Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus. And they went and they begged the body of Jesus. They took it down from the cross. They laid it in a new tomb. They washed the blood and the dirt from his body and then wrapped it in clean white linen. Then they placed a linen napkin over his face and around his head. 
And you can just imagine after they had got his body in place and everything was done, getting ready to walk back out of that tomb. Again, these tombs were uh, inside the walls of a, of a rock. And uh, so they were backing out going. They would just stay there and maybe stare for just a few moments at this one that they had loved so much. And then they walked out. And then they roll the stone in place. It seemed to be over. The end of a beautiful dream. The end of a ministry that lasted just three short years. Now it seemed to be over. Jesus cried again. It is finished. And to many people, uh, they heard, I am finished. We know that's not the case. But they had misunderstood him. See, the the Jewish people wanted wanted Jesus to ascend to the throne and to get the Romans off of their backs. They wanted a kingdom right here and now on earth. Instead, uh, the one that they loved so much and the one that ministered to them so much was killed on a cross like a Roman, like a common criminal. And matter of fact, we know that there was a criminal on either side of him when he died. And after his burial, three days passed. Folks, that had to be the three saddest days on planet Earth. Three of the darkest days this world has ever seen. But on the third day, on the third day, the darkness lifted. Jesus woke up. And you can just see him now. Uh, uh, He kind of rubbed the sleep of death from his eyes. And he walked out into the morning light. The angel that was there to roll the stone away was there not to roll the stone so he could get out. It was so that we could get in and see. And can you imagine the angel that morning when he came to roll the stone away? Jesus was there and that angel said, Good morning, Master. Good morning, Master. Can you just imagine We know that, uh, again, the angel rolled the stone away, so Mary, we read about her, Mary Magdalene, so that she could uh, look in there and see that the body of Jesus was not there anymore. John and Peter came, and uh, John was a lot younger than Peter, so uh, he ran a lot faster than Peter. And he got there before Peter did, but John was a lot younger, and he didn't know if he wanted to go in there or not. But Peter, as brash as he was, of course, he just, man, he didn't stop. He just went right in to see what was going on. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. Something unusual, though, about this scene. Something very unusual. The napkin that was about the Lord's head was not lying with the clothes. Instead, it was in a place by itself, neatly folded. And, of course, that is very significant. You know, God doesn't do things without significance. And when he, when he told us this in this story, it's very, very significant. You have to understand Hebrew customs to understand the napkin. Did you read that in verse 7? The napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself, neatly folded. What, what would happen is uh, you have to go back to the customs of masters and servants. When a, when a servant... Uh, uh, served a master and he, he prided himself in knowing his master's wants and when he prepared the table for him to dine when the servant prepared the table for the master to dine he made sure that everything was just right then the servant would back up and kind of get out of sight from what was going on at the meal the master would sit down and eat and this was kind of their way of communication the master would sit down and eat, and if he got up from the table, took, took uh, his napkin, wiped his face, and then wadded it up and put it down, the meal was over. The servant would then rush in and clear the table. But if the master got up, wiped his mouth with the napkin, folded the napkin very neatly back up and laid it on his plate, the servant would not move the master was saying i am not finished i am coming back 
Well, it made no difference how long the master was gone. Don't touch that table. He's not finished. He's coming back. Now that custom was passed down through the years and John wanted to let us know about that folded napkin. And I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus says, I'm not finished yet. And I am coming back. It is not over. And that folded napkin let them know that He was alive and He is alive forevermore. And Jesus only had to die once, by the way. He only had to die once. And I I ask people this all the time. I said, listen, if you can earn your way to heaven, why did Jesus come down here and die? Why did He go through all that suffering? But He died so that we could be saved. So I say to you this morning, last week he said, it is finished. And today, after the resurrection, he says, I am not finished. Three thoughts I have for you this morning. Number one, you'll see them on the board. Jesus is not finished saving the lost. Jesus is not finished saving the lost. The Bible says in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost and headed for hell. And I'm telling you right now, He has not finished doing so yet. When He died on the cross, uh, again, he, he, He said, it is finished. And that meant that the wonderful plan of salvation was finished. All that, the, all that Jesus had to do, uh, that was required to do for our salvation was done. And the, and the resurrection, folks, is an indication that the Father, God the Father, was satisfied with the sacrifice of His Son. If He was not satisfied, Jesus would still be dead today. The payment for sin has been made. The one who paid the payment is coming back again. The napkin is still folded. He is not finished. Now, aren't you glad Jesus is not done saving folks? Because you wouldn't be saved today if He was done. If He had finished a hundred years ago, you wouldn't be saved. Uh, uh, But He's not finished and he's not going to be finished until he comes back, of course. And, and, and even, even after that, as we've talked about on Sunday night here lately. Now, listen, if you're not saved here today, he's still in the soul-saving business. He can save your soul. And uh, that. Now, I read this story about this family that moved into a new community. And... Uh, The pastor of the nearby church met them somehow, and he invited them to attend the services. He said, why don't you come and visit with us? Well, the man assured the preacher, he said, I will come as soon as I get everything straightened out. Several months passed, and the man still had not come to church. So the pastor saw him again and repeated his invitation. Well, he got the same reply. I just, when I get everything straightened out, I'll be there. And I will be there, preacher, as soon as I get everything straightened out. Well, a few weeks later, he died. And his widow asked the preacher to have the funeral services in the church. The preacher graciously agreed, and it was indeed a very sad affair. And later, when a member of the church asked the pastor if the man was a Christian, he answered, well, he never attended services here. And no one can ever recall hearing him give a testimony of his faith in Christ, so it's really hard to say. I only know, the preacher said, he was a man of his word. He promised to come to church just as soon as he got straightened out. And that's what he did. He got straightened out in the coffin and came into church. Now that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to get saved before all of that, before you die. And Jesus is still in the soul-saving business. Secondly, He's not finished reclaiming backsliders. He's not finished reclaiming backsliders. All right, I want you to back up to Mark chapter 16, if you would, if you have your Bible. Mark chapter 16. And we're going to read Mark's account of this particular story. Mark chapter number 16, the last chapter of Mark. Mark chapter number 16. 
Verse number one. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. That is a very significant scripture as well. Uh, these ladies had come to the tomb. Uh, they going to do spices. Well, they found out Jesus was not there. All right? But it's very significant what we see here in verse number 7, that the angels told these ladies, Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter. Now... Was Peter one of the disciples of Christ? Yes, he was. Why do you think uh, the angels would say, tell his disciples and Peter that he went into Galilee? Why do you think they would do that? Why, why wouldn't they just say, go tell his disciples? Why would they have to say, and Peter? You have to think about that for a moment. Well, I'll give you the reason, and I'll give you the understanding why today they would say, and Peter. Because what had Peter just done? He had denied the Lord. How many times? Three times. He had denied the Lord three times. And if you remember that story, the last time, of course, that he did it, uh, his eyes met with the Lord's. And he went out and wept bitterly, Peter did. And so the Lord uh, was ready to reclaim a backslider because later on, we'll not deal with that, uh, read that story, but later on, the Lord met Peter one on one and gave him an opportunity to be restored. And see, that's the way our God is. Let me tell you, God is the God of, of, uh, of reclaiming backsliders. Listen, you get saved and then you wander off from the Lord a little bit. Or maybe a whole lot. You wander away from the Lord. Well, the Lord is standing right there. By the way, the Lord never moved. You're the one that moved, and He's standing right there waiting to take you back. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you at one time were on fire for God and you, you just love the Lord and you didn't miss church and, and, and you love serving the Lord. And now, for whatever reason, you've got away from the Lord. Well, let me tell you something. He's ready to reclaim backsliders today and he's not finished doing it yet. On Wednesday night, we're talking about David. And David, uh, this Wednesday night, uh, the story is Nathan the prophet coming to David and pointing his, his, his finger in, in David's face and saying, You're the man. Thou art the man. And we're going to talk about that Wednesday night. David had committed adultery. David had committed murder. And yet the Lord stood there waiting to restore him back to fellowship. He was away from God. He was out of fellowship with God. And he says in Psalm 51, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That's what I want. And today some of y'all need the, the joy of your salvation, the joy of, of, of knowing the Lord and serving the Lord. It needs to be reclaimed and restored in your life. The Lord knew and the angels, of course, knew what Peter had done. But Peter was one that needed to be restored, needed to be reclaimed, a backslider. Had denied the Lord who he had been with for the last three and a half years. He denied him three times, not just once. But then Peter was restored, and of course, just a few weeks later, he preached on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people got saved. Amazing story. He was restored. And then thirdly this morning, Jesus is not finished yet. He's not finished sanctifying Christians. He is not finished sanctifying Christians. You know what sanctifying means? By the way, if you're a Christian, God's trying to sanctify you, uh, uh, whether you know it or not. Uh, uh, and we all need to be sanctified. 
And you might hear that from time to time. The word sanctified means to be set apart as holy unto God. Now, the word sanctified does not mean sinless perfection. We're not, we're not uh, after sinless perfection, and, and no matter how hard you try, it's not going to work in your life. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know what Paul's saying there in Romans chapter 1? He said, Lord, I I just give myself to you. I give my body. I give my mind. I give my eyes to you. I want to look at that which is good. I want to read your word. Here are my feet. May they walk in your steps. Here are my hands. May they do the work of the ministry. I present my body a living sacrifice. I present my life a living sacrifice to you. I want you to sanctify me. I want you to set me apart as holy unto God. Why should we present ourselves a living sacrifice? Why? Because the napkin is still folded. He is still sending out sanctified Christians. There's a song that um, I learned and heard many, many years ago. Probably when I was in high school, maybe even before that. And I remember, I believe it was Sandy Patty that uh, used to sing it. Some of you will recognize that name. And it goes like this. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. And that's what it's all about. He's still working on me. We're growing and changing to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. He's still working on us. Is He working on you? Because He's working on me. But see, I want to grow and change again to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So, imagine Jesus wakes up on that Easter morning. Kind of rubs rubs his eyes and wakes up. I don't know if he stretches or whatever. Just imagine that. And he gets up and he is wearing those linen clothes and he takes those aside, folds them up, then he takes that napkin that was on his head and face and neatly folds it up and puts it in a separate place. Telling all that would see, it's not over for me. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished. Now I'm coming back. There is going to come a day, though, when he's going to be finished. He is going to be coming back. Are you ready for that day? 1 Corinthians 15, I talked about it earlier, where Paul had to write this chapter to the Corinthians to get them uh, uh, to understand the resurrection. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now that's the motto in church nurseries, too, by the way. We shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed. See, we're, we're uh, asleep in the Bible, of course, talks about death. And uh, we're all going to be changed in a moment, the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and shall, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Right now, God's still working. He's not finished. He wants people to be saved. 
He wants backsliders to be restored, to be reclaimed. He wants Christians to be sanctified. And He's working on us. But there's coming a day when you're not going to have another chance to be saved. If you're saved, you're not going to have another chance to be reclaimed, be restored as a backslider, to get right with God. And there's not going to be another day for you to grow and change to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to come to an end. But especially today, I talk to those who may be here and do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. There's there's coming a day, whether Jesus comes back or whether you die, that there will be no other chance for God to work in your life. It will be too late. There is not a second chance. Right now, the napkin is folded. But before long, in essence, Jesus is going to pick that napkin up. He's just going to wad it up, put it back on the plate, and says, it's over. It's over. I am finished now. And then you'll have to stand before Him in the condition that you're in at that time. What condition will it be? You know, people go out into eternity every day, totally unexpected. You say, well, I'll get around to that sooner or later. Well, you may not have any later. We don't know what a day is going to bring forth. I encourage you. I beg you. I plead with you. Paul uses the word beseech to get saved today. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're going to have an invitation song here this morning. We're going to see who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you know Him today, would you come, Patty? Would you play something for us? Uh, would If, if um, you know the Lord Jesus Christ today, I pray that you'll rejoice in that. Are you allowing God to sanctify you? Are you allowing God to work in your life? If you're here today and you've lost the joy of your salvation, Jesus wants to reclaim you, restore you, as He did Peter as he did David, can restore the joy of your salvation. But if you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. We encourage you to come to know Christ. Father, thank you for, again, your word and this story today, for this beautiful day, this Easter Sunday. Pray, Lord, that you'll bless these thoughts to the hearts of those that are here. Lord, if there's someone that needs to know Christ, or other decisions need to be made, I pray they'll be made today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.